How would you define resistance? Does it have to be armed, or can it be unarmed? People who study history for a living have a difficult time agreeing on a definition of resistance during the Holocaust. Scholars each have their own definition of resistance, and these definitions lead them to different conclusions about Jewish resistance to the Holocaust. Some define it as only acts of armed resistance. Others include unarmed resistance, like smuggling food into ghettos or sabotaging their work, in their definitions. Some scholars even say that it can only be counted as resistance if there is a direct threat of punishment for the actions. Finally, some claim that individual acts of resistance cannot be considered true resistance and that people must have been working as a group. A person's definition of resistance affects how many examples they can find and what they conclude about how much Jewish resistance occurred throughout World War II. Narrower definitions provide fewer examples and are not as good as broader definitions that will give you a better context and understanding of what happened. The type of defiance that is most often included in people's definitions is armed resistance. There were multiple obstacles to armed resistance that made it difficult for Jews to participate. The first obstacle was the lack of weapons. In ghettos, where Jews were forced into overcrowded parts of cities with little food and many diseases, and in concentration camps like Auschwitz, it was difficult for them to get weapons. Also, in camps and ghettos, the victims were not given enough food and were too weak to fight the Nazis. The last obstacle for armed resistance was backlash from the Nazis. In many cases, Nazis would kill multiple Jews or other prisoners to punish them for the death or injury of one Nazi soldier. Sometimes, the Jews who were killed had little or nothing to do with the injury or death of the Nazi. This made it very difficult for Jews who wanted to resist by using weapons. They had to ask themselves if the deaths of one or two soldiers were worth the many lives that would potentially be lost as punishment. Despite these obstacles, Jewish underground resistance movements were created in 100 ghettos throughout Nazi-occupied Europe between 1941 and 1943. Armed resistance was direct, visible, and typically targeted the Nazis. Two examples of armed resistance are the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and the Sobibor Uprising. In 1943, 750 young Jews fought the Germans in the Warsaw Ghetto in Poland to resist being transported to a death camp called Treblinka. They recently heard that if they got transported, they would all be killed. They decided that they would rather fight and potentially survive than go to the death camp where they were sure that they would be killed. In participating in the uprising, they were able to fight for themselves and hurt the Nazis. The uprising lasted for over a month before being defeated by the Germans, who then burned down the ghetto. Thousands of Jews were either killed or transported during the uprising and after it ended. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was significant because even though the Germans won in the end, the Jews were vastly outnumbered and fought for over a month against all odds and were able to organize the resources and people to make it happen. Another important uprising was the Sobibor Uprising in 1943. Sobibor was a death camp in Poland where prisoners planned an escape. They killed the guards and took their guns, and they then cut the telephone wires and set the camp on fire. About 300 people escaped the camp, but many were caught while running through the forest, and only 50 survived the war. This uprising was important because had they not revolted, many of them would have died in the camp. Instead, some survived and the camp was shut down because the Nazis were embarrassed and wanted to hide the evidence. People don't include unarmed defiance as often in their definitions of resistance during the Holocaust. However, including it in your definition opens the door to countless examples of people defying the Nazis and their terror. The main goal of unarmed resistance was typically to help victims retain their humanity and create a sense of unity within the community by boosting morale rather than hurting the Nazis. An example of this is Jews who continue to practice their religion in the ghettos and camps despite the danger. Some acts of unarmed resistance like Jews who sabotaged the work that they were forced to do, were targeting their oppressors and trying to make them lose the war. One distinction between acts of unarmed resistance that is important in some scholars' definitions is if the acts were performed as a group or by an individual. Some scholars define resistance as acts that were performed as a group, so they do not include any acts of individual defiance in their arguments. However, in order to have a good understanding of resistance during the Holocaust, 
both group and individual acts of resistance must be considered. An example of both armed and unarmed group resistance is that of the Bielski brothers, Tuvia, Azael, and Zeus. Around 1941, the brothers established a base in the forest near their family home in Belarusia, and promised that it would be open to all Jews. As Tuvia said, he would rather save one old Jewish woman than kill ten German soldiers. As the group gained members, they moved to different forests throughout the area, trying to stay ahead of the Nazis. By 1943, the group had 800 members, many of whom were escapees from ghettos rescued by the fighting men of the Bielski group. In the forest, this group of Jews created a community that included homes, a synagogue, a school, and a theater. While many in this group were armed and participated in guerrilla warfare against the Nazis, many also simply lived in their makeshift village. In this way, much of what the Bielski brothers did was unarmed resistance, and they aimed to thwart Hitler by preserving Jewish life more so than by directly attacking the Nazis. Another example of group unarmed resistance to the Nazis happened in the Vilna ghetto in Lithuania. By establishing a public health system, the inhabitants of the Vilna ghetto aimed to thwart the Nazis' genocidal plan by preserving Jewish life to whatever extent they could. In the ghettos, there were many health and sanitation threats, including overcrowding, inadequate water supply, and lack of food, medicine, and heating. Vilna was a center of Jewish medicine before the war, and the ghetto encompassed the Jewish hospital, allowing Jewish doctors to implement a plan for public health. Some of the solutions included tea houses, where people could go to use hot water for cooking, cleaning and washing, food distribution based on need, food rationing, and guidelines for food preparation, the production of vitamin supplements from waste products, and food smuggling campaigns organized by the Jewish Council. Through their efforts to promote sanitation and public health, the Vilna Ghetto managed to preserve many Jewish lives that otherwise would have been lost to disease or starvation. After escaping from his forced labor one day, Frank Bleichmann used his connections with his Polish friends to get food at a reasonable price. He then smuggled it into his small village and sold it to Jewish families. This was illegal, and he could have been killed. During the war, there were strict food rations, especially for Jewish people. Frank and his Polish friends risked a lot to smuggle more food to the Jews in the village. Smuggling food into villages, ghettos, and concentration camps was an important form of resistance during the war. Without the extra food that was smuggled into these areas, many people could not have survived wartime starvation. During her time in Auschwitz, Bella Katzanyari, a member of a Jewish underground resistance group, tried to use her strength to help those weaker than her. When she was assigned to serve soup to her fellow prisoners, she tried to give the weakest people in line the most nourishing soup from the bottom of the pot. In doing this, she tried to help save other prisoners who were weak physically and mentally. Several times, she heard people comment about how they noticed and appreciated that she purposely gave them a good bowl of soup. Her goal was to help others survive by giving them the nutrients that they needed and an extra glimmer of hope, which were both important to help people survive the camps. When studying methods of Jewish resistance during the Holocaust, the definition that a person uses is very important. Broader definitions that include armed, unarmed, group, and individual actions are the best to gain a good understanding of the variety of resistance during the Holocaust. Having a broader definition allows us to find more examples of resistance. People during World War II resisted the Nazis and persecution in various ways depending on what their situations were and what was available to them. Many did not have access to weapons or did not think that such obvious ways of resistance were worth risking the lives of their family and friends. As demonstrated by the examples in this video, all forms of resistance were important during the Holocaust. As you study the Holocaust, keep in mind that Jewish resistance during World War II is a complex subject that is greatly dependent on one's definition of resistance.